Three days of darkness. Is it real? Is it in the Bible? Did St. Padre Pio teach the three days of darkness? And is it in the apocalypse? Will it lead to a new era of, sorry, era, not error, era of Catholic devotion and a renewal in the church? We're going to cover all that today. Before we do, we will begin in pray. prayer. We'll say the Our Father in Latin, and then we'll begin with Scripture and some of the controversies surrounding the three days of darkness, and of course, explain what it means. So, let us pray. Oremos. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Patro noster, qui est in celi, sanctificator nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, three days of darkness. Uh, it's actually not in the New Testament. People are surprised. Uh, I've heard so many people say, Oh, well, in the book of Revelations, and they say Revelations, and man, if you watch my channel, you know how much I hate that, because it's the book of the one Revelation, singular, and we Catholics should probably be calling it the Apocalypse, the book of the Apocalypse. Uh, Revelation is the Latin version of Apocalypse. It means to take off the veil, to un. Veil. That's what apocalypse means. That's what revelation means to reveal, to pull back the veil. It's not in the apocalypse. The closest that we get in the New Testament uh, is the fifth. Let me pull it up here. It's the fifth angel in the book of the apocalypse. It's Revelation 16.10. I'll put that on the screen for y'all to see it. And it describes the coming darkness that will come at a certain point in the apocalypse. It's Revelation or Apocalypse 16.10, and it reads, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom became dark, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So there certainly is something in the apocalypse about extreme darkness as a punishment on the ungodly, a punishment against the beast, does not mention here the three days. Uh, that comes from private revelation and from the Old Testament, as we're about to see. But there is something in the eschatological plan that includes darkness as a punishment on those who serve Satan. That is, he poured out his vial on the seat of the beast, it's also important here to realize that uh, Scripture and the Holy Ghost are depicting the power of the beast, the power of the Antichrist as a seat. This parallels in Catholicism in that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Mary, assumed, is seated at the right hand of Christ. And the Pope, who is the successor of St. Peter, sits on the apostolic see, the see of Peter. So the seat in the Old Testament and in the New is the sign of authority. And here we have the angel pouring out this vial, this punishment, not on the beast, but on the seat of the beast. That is his place of authority, his place of teaching, his place of jurisdiction. And when the angel does that, the kingdom, his kingdom, kingdom of the beast, not the kingdom of Christ, becomes dark. Now, if you're interested in the book of the apocalypse, I did a multi-part series. It's available for free here on YouTube. It's also available at New St. Thomas Institute, where I go line by line through the book of Revelation, through the apocalypse, and do a Catholic commentary using the saints, the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, to try to make sense of the apocalypse. So please go and check that out. Now, What's going on here in Apocalypse 16.10, the angel pouring out this vial on the seat of the beast and becoming uh, his kingdom becoming dark, 
does harken back to something that we read in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are the 10 plagues. You'll remember that the Israelites were in Egypt and they were slaves. They were in bondage. And God finally brought about their redemption to buy them back out of Egypt. And he raised up the prophet Moses. And we've all seen the movie Ten Commandments and Moses with his staff. And he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now, Pharaoh is an Old Testament type of of the Antichrist, of the ungodly king, of the king who promotes idolatry and the worship of demons and persecutes the people of God. So that's who Pharaoh is. Often in patristic literature, the devil is compared to Pharaoh. Uh, so Pharaoh is a type of the devil. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's the ungodly king. And so Moses, who is a type of Christ, he with his staff initiates the 10 plagues upon Egypt. Now, I've put them up on the screen there on your left. And in Exodus 10.22, we read, And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. Very important here because it's not Moses doing the miracle. It's God, and Moses is showing that. And there came horrible darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. Three days of darkness. So the idea of three days of darkness derives from the Old Testament. Again, in the New Testament, we don't see three days of darkness. We see three hours of darkness, and I'll get to that in a moment. We just see the fifth angel with the darkness after he pours out his vial on the seat of the beast. Now, these ten plagues are first blood. This is when water turns to blood. Then there's the frogs. Then there's the gnats or the lice, depending on how you translate the Hebrew, and the flies, and then the plague upon the livestock, the cattle, then the boils upon the flesh, then the hail, then the locusts, then number nine is the three days of darkness and the death of the firstborn. Now, this is a parallel, it's a type pointing forward to Christ. Remember, Christ fulfills the entire Old Testament. Christ fulfills every jot and tittle of the Old Testament. Uh, if, you, if you join New St. Thomas Institute, I do a whole course on every single book of the Old Testament and show how every single book, all of them, including the seven Deuterocanonicals, are fulfilled and point towards Jesus Christ, Our Lady, the sacraments, the church, etc. Now you'll see here, you have all of these plagues culminating in three days of darkness and the death of the firstborn. Now, think back to Good Friday. He has the passion. He's scourged. He carries the cross. And then we read in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 27, 45, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the whole earth until the ninth hour. So we know in sacred scripture, I'll put it up on the screen so y'all can see it more clearly. We know from the Gospels that before the death of the firstborn, look over there on the list on the left side of your screen, there's the three days of darkness and the death of the firstborn. We know that there were three hours of darkness over the whole earth, not just Jerusalem, it seems, and then the death of the firstborn. The firstborn who? The firstborn of God. Jesus Christ. So we see this fulfillment happening. And I think if these private revelations are true, we're going to get into the private revelations here next. If they're true, my read on this, again, I'm just a layman. I'm not a Pope. I'm not a Cardinal. I'm not anybody. But my read on this is, if you listen to Our Lady of La Salette, you realize the church is going to go into eclipse. Maybe it has already. Seems so. And you realize that the church will enter into a final passion. The church will enter into her own triduum. She will be conformed perfectly with her groom, Jesus Christ. And she will go through confusion. Peter will deny her three times. The apostles, who we know as the successors of the apostles, the bishops, will run away. Except for one-twelfth of them, that is St. John, the beloved apostle. 
a Judas Iscariot from the inner inner heart, the trust of the church, will betray her master. And we know, of course, Our Lady will be right there until the very end. And so many holy people have seen this parallel and said the church will be betrayed by Judas. The bishops will run away. Peter will deny three times. But Mary will be there close to Jesus all the way to the end. That's the that's the anchor that we all have to hold on to during this tar- dark time. And just as there were three days of darkness under Moses and there were three hours of darkness at the crucifixion of Christ, there will be in this passion of the church three days of darkness that will purify the church. That's one thesis, one theory. Again, I'm not saying it's de fide, that this is dogma. I'm just trying to connect some dots here. There's a bunch of stars, and we're trying to find the constellation. And that's my suggestion. Now, another controversy about the three days of darkness is Padre Pio. Almost everyone out there says, well, Padre Pio taught it. I don't think this is true. I did some research. Uh, There is no good. Now, Padre Pio said a lot of things to a lot of people, and they weren't written down. But there's nothing documented that Padre Pio ever taught the three days of darkness. He may have believed it, but there's nothing documented. And on top of that, the Capuchin Franciscans have a notarized statement stating that Padre Pio never said this or never taught the three days. So even the Capuchin order has made a statement on it. So I think we should reserve judgment on that. And I don't think that in order to talk about three days of darkness, we have to say, well, Padre Pio taught it. Because you can, go, you can go on blogs, you can go on websites, and you'll find some a quote from Padre Pio about this. So those are the those are the two um, most debated elements about three days of darkness. Is Padre Pio taught it? It doesn't seem that he did. And oh, it's in the Book of Revelation. It's in the Apocalypse. That's not true either. There is the fifth angel, and there's darkness, but it doesn't say the three days of darkness. It doesn't talk about beeswax candles or any of the demons outside. We will get to that in just a moment. So those are, I think, two things that everyone watching right now, I'd like you to know that you shouldn't go around saying Padre Pio taught this and you shouldn't go around saying, well, it's in the book of Revelation. It's in the apocalypse. Okay, but where is it? Where is it? Well, the most common source is from this lady right here. Let me put her on the screen. A little big there. This is Anna Maria Taiji. She was born in 1769, and she died in 1837. She was Italian. She was a professed member of the Secular Trinitarians. She was a mother. She was the mother of seven children. Of these children, I think, let's see, three of those children died as infants. Four of them lived on. When she was visiting Rome, she had a massive conversion, and she began to have visitations, apparitions, messages from Jesus Christ. She was beatified by Pope Pius IX in 1863, which is pretty impressive. Uh, This lady died in 1837, and she was beatified 1863 by Pius IX. So that's uh, under 30 years for her beatification. And this wasn't during the time of fast-tracked beatifications and canonization. So her, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. She wasn't beatified. Her process was open in 1863. Um, And she was beatified in 1920. I'm sorry, I was looking at my notes wrong. She was beatified in the 20s by Benedict the 15th. So... A process of about 80-something years for her to be beatified. Still pretty fast. Not as fast as I, I thought just now, but still pretty fast. She was beatified in, in that short amount of time by Benedict the Fifteenth. I'm sorry. Now, the prophecy that she, she has many prophecies, many private revelations. The one that I'm about to read to you is found in her beatification documents. 
you'll know that anytime someone is beatified or canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church, they bring all their writings together. And before 1983, um, a man, a scholar, a priest usually, played the role of devil's advocate. He didn't serve the devil. His job was, let's try to find any dirt on this person because we don't want to canonize a priest who has an illegitimate child or had a some sort of you know strange financial dealings uh, in the church. So there was always a priest whose job was to investigate and find if there was anything um, incorrect, inconsistent, or sinful in that person's life before they moved forward. Now, when they, they bring together all the writings of that saint and they have theologians and scholars read through all the documents and see if there's anything heretical. Again, you don't want to beatify or canonize someone who teaches something heretical. And in that collection, we find this prophecy. It's a private revelation from Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, and it describes in detail the three days of darkness. So I'm going to read that for you now. It's about uh, three paragraphs long, so bear with me, but it gives you a lot of good information. She says, God will ordain two punishments, one in the form of wars, revolutions, and other evils. These will originate on earth. The other will be sent from heaven. There will come over all the earth an intense darkness lasting three days and three nights. Nothing will be visible and the air will be laden with pestilence, which will claim principally, but not exclusively, the enemies of religion. Only blessed candles can be lighted and will afford illumination. So I'm going to pause here. Uh, there's two punishments. One is down here in the form of wars and pestilence. The second comes from heaven and says three days of darkness. And only blessed candles will be able to afford illumination, she says. All the enemies of the church secret as well as known, will perish over the whole earth during that universal darkness, with the exception of a few whom God will soon after convert. The air shall be infected by demons who will appear under all sorts of hideous forms. After the three days of darkness, St. Peter and St. Paul, having come down from heaven, will preach in the whole world and designate a new pope. A great light will flash from their bodies and will settle upon the cardinal, the future pontiff. Then Christianity will spread throughout the world. He is the holy pontiff, chosen by God to withstand the storm. At the end, he will have the gift of miracles, and his name shall be praised over the whole earth. End quote. Wow, there's a lot here, and if this is true, whoa, amazing. Amazing. Now, this is private revelation, so no Catholic is obliged to believe this. In fact, you can reject it in good faith. Uh, this lady is not a saint. She is a blessed, so she has some approbation in the church. Many other saints and holy people have praised her and have been devoted to her. But this is what she claims she received from Jesus Christ. So just to give you the high points here, there are two punishments coming. One is from earth, and it's the form of wars and revolutions. This is why people ask me, Taylor, do you think we're in the end times? I don't think we're close yet because we don't have wars and revolutions. And then the other is from heaven, and it's the darkness that lasts three days. Nothing will be visible, and the air will have pestilence. So something is wrong with the air. You can't see anything. And then she gives us this detail, only blessed candles can be lighted and will afford illumination. So light bulbs aren't going to work, your computer's not going to work, your car is not going to work. Um, any of the man-made forms of light, apparently even lighting a fire or something like that is not going to work. Only blessed candles, we get blessed candles at Candlemas, February 2nd, and uh, I'm going to tell you how to get blessed candles. In fact, if you look at the just underneath me, uh, there's a link to Amazon where you can get beeswax candles. You're supposed to have beeswax candles. 
and you can ask your priest to bless them. I'll get to that at the very end of this video. The, the next thing is that the enemies of the church are going to be killed during this three days of darkness. We also see that the air will be infected by demons who will appear in hideous forms. And then the really interesting part of Blessed Anna Maria Taiji in her prophecy is that Peter and Paul will have an apparition. They will somehow proclaim the gospel and then they will appoint, according to her, a new pope. So light is going to come out and land somehow and designate a cardinal and he will be the new pope. So this assumes that somehow the previous pope is not there. Um, did the pope, uh, did he die? Was he a martyr? Um, did he lose the papacy? Did he resign? What happened? I mean, there's a lot of controversies nowadays over the papacy and the pope, and we got Benedict and Francis and all that. But here, there's some supernatural intervention to appoint a cardinal as pope. So that's uh, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi. There are other holy people who have had uh, prophecies regarding the, the three days of darkness. There's St. Gaspar de Buffalo. He says this, The death of the impenitent persecutor of the church will take place during the three days of darkness. He who outlives the darkness in the fear of these three days will think that he is alone on earth because the whole world will be covered with cadavers. Wow. Now, uh, St. Gaspar lived, he was canonized in 1954, and he lived in the 1800s. So he lives uh, somewhat after Blessed Anna Maria Taigi. We also have Blessed Mary of Jesus Crucified. She says, during a darkness lasting three days, the people given to evil will perish, so that only one-fourth of mankind will survive. And then we also have Venerable Isabel Canori Mora. She says, As soon as St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, had gathered the flock of Jesus Christ in a place of safety, he re reascended into heaven accompanied by legion of angels. Scarcely had they disappeared when the sky was covered with clouds so dense and dismal that it was impossible to look at them without dismay. On a sudden, there burst out a terrible and violent wind, and its noise sounded like roars of furious lions. The sound of, of furious hurricanes was heard over the whole earth. Fear and terror struck not only men, but the very beasts. So here we have darkness, but she doesn't mention the number three. So this would, of course, conform to what we saw in the book of the Apocalypse. Uh, I also have a, another one here from someone who's not beatified. This is Marie de, uh, de la Frodae. She says, There will come three days of complete darkness. Only blessed candles made of wax will give some light during this horrible darkness. One candle will last three days. But they will not give light in the houses of the godless. Lighting and Lighting will penetrate your houses, but it will not put out the blessed candles. I'm sorry, lightning. Lightning will penetrate your houses, but it will not put out the blessed candles. Neither wind, nor storm, nor earthquake will put out the blessed candles. So, there are many of them. Now, a skeptic would say, well, all of these begin, all these prophecies and private revelations, they pretty much do begin in the 1800s. Uh, and it seems that blessed... Uh, Maria Anna Taiji is the first one to give such a clear and articulate prophecy that there will be three days of darkness, uh, it will kill the ungodly, and only blessed candles will light during the three days of darkness. Now, is this for real? I don't know. I know the exact information that you know, and that is there have been many holy people, beatified and canonized, who have explicitly stated that they receive from a supernatural source 
there will be three days of darkness. I know for a fact that God did it in the past. Every single one of us who believes the Bible knows that God has already done a three days of darkness in Egypt with Pharaoh. It was the ninth plague. It was right before the death of the firstborn. So we know it's been done before. We know there are three hours of darkness at the death of our Lord Jesus Christ when he saved us from our sins. So we know that. I think it does make sense that there would be an end times three days of darkness. And we also know from the book of the apocalypse that, and I'll, let me put that back on the, the screen here. The book of the apocalypse, chapter 16, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast and his kingdom became dark and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So we do know that darkness will be part of of the apocalypse. Also, I didn't mention before, interesting fact there, they nod their tongues for pain. What does that mean? Well, tongues in the Old Testament is how we preach and praise, preach about God and praise God. If you read the Psalms, it's always, you know, prepare my tongue, my tongue sings. Um, so, we, of course, we receive the Eucharist on the tongue. But the ungodly use, and then there's the tongues of fire at Pentecost. So this whole idea of tongues is very important. And it's another reason why I'm very uh, insistent about communion on the tongue. But they nod their tongues because the ungodly use their tongues to pray Satan and to teach demonic doctrines. And so they know that their punishment of darkness relates to what they have spoken against God. This is why the ungodly and those who serve the beasts gnaw their tongues for pain. So there are all of these elements. Like I mentioned earlier, we see a pattern of stars. And so I think we can conclude and say, that's a constellation. I think this should happen. What do we do to prepare? Well, I have insurance for my house. I don't think my house is going to burn down. I don't think Lightning is going to hit it and it's going to burn down. I don't think my kids are going to play with matches in the kitchen and burn it down. But I know it could happen. And so I buy home insurance. I have insurance on my cars. I don't think I'm going to get in a wreck this year, but I have insurance. I have life insurance. I'm a healthy guy. I don't think I'm going to die this year, but I have life insurance to help care for my wife and kids if I should die. And so for me, I'm like, all I need is some wax candles. I mean, at first you got to be in a state of grace and, and follow Jesus Christ, but I just need some wax candles that are blessed by a priest. Done. I'm going to do it. So I would encourage you, just think of it as a, I mean, wax candles are going to cost you, order a few. If you buy a collection of them, I don't know, $20, $30. I have a link. I don't get any, um, this isn't my wax company. I'm not profiting on it, but you can go on Amazon.com and get some candles. I'm going to put a link here in the in the in the live chat. Wax candles. There you go. Beeswax candles. You want the beeswax candles? Um, let's see. Can I get a picture of these? I won't worry about it. You can you can click the link. Uh, hey, if this is real, I want the candles. In fact, we had some friends over. They're probably watching now because I said, hey, I'm going to do this video for y'all. And we had some friends over. We were talking about it. And uh, Joy's like, I'm going to go check and make sure we still have our blessed candles. And so she went and checked. She said, yeah, we got the blessed candles because we got them. You know, we had blessed candles uh, for us. Uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And we just weren't sure if they were still there, or if we lit them at a dinner party or something. And then uh, I did all this research yesterday for this show. And last night, right before I fell asleep. I was thinking about it and I was like, Joy. She's like, Yeah. I was like, You saw those blessed candles. We got blessed candles. She said, Yeah, we got blessed candles. I confirmed it. We have blessed candles. So we're set. So I think, why not? You know, these are holy people. These are Catholics. There's some stuff in the Bible kind of about it. Padre Pio, I don't think, said anything about it. So don't bank on that. To me, I think it's probable and it's a small act of faith to simply buy some beeswax candles. Again, if the moderators can put the link to the beeswax candles. And again, you can't just have beeswax candles. They got to be blessed. So you have to take them to your priest and say, will you please bless my candles? At my parish, which is Fraternity of St. Peter, once a month they do blessings of all kinds of things. 
crucifixes, medals, statues, everything. And I always see someone bringing some candles up there to bring some candles, ask the priest to, to bless them. Someone asked, does it have to be beeswax? I've heard it has to be beeswax. So just get the beeswax ones. The, the link I just sent you, they're beeswax candles on Amazon or wherever you, wherever you buy your candles, just get some beeswax candles. And some people are like, does it have to be 100% beeswax? Can it be 51% beeswax? I don't know. Just get the beeswax ones. Get 100% beeswax candles and you'll be set. If you have candles left over from candle mass, you're good. Um, I'm not sure if, if baptismal candles anymore are made out of beeswax. I don't know. Look, I'm just saying it's a cheap $20 insurance policy. Get some beeswax candles and you're done. So there it is. Three days of darkness. Lots of people have been asking for me to do this video. I think it's because of everything going on in the world. Are we in the end times? Whatever. Corona crisis. Um, crises in the church. Confusion about the Pope. Confusion about morals and doctrine and all these things. Uh, sexual scandals, financial scandals, all of these things that are just rocking us. People are confused and they're like, this could be the end. We might see three days of darkness coming. Can you do a show on three days of darkness? Here it is. I think, I'm not sure, but I think I've given you all the information there is on three days of darkness. I gave you some private revelation. I gave you Exodus. I gave you the apocalypse. I gave you Matthew's gospel and the three hours of darkness. Unless there's something new or some, I think that is all the info. Is it conclusive? To me, it's not conclusive, but I still got blessed wax candles in my house. And I think you should too. So get those wax candles. I'll close up just by saying, please like this video. If it was helpful to you, if it brought some clarity, um, please like the video, please subscribe to this channel. If you're new, if you subscribe, hit the notification button and turn that bell on. If you watch this on an iPhone or a tablet, make sure you turn on also your YouTube notifications. Otherwise you won't be notified at all. That's just how YouTube rolls these days. Please right now on the bottom right of your screen, hit the share button and share this video on Facebook or Twitter, wherever you do Instagram. I would really appreciate if you shared this video. It means a lot to me. And uh, of course, thank you to all the Patreon patrons who make this channel possible and all the new ones that just signed up. There's a stack of books on the other side of that door of my books that I'll be signing and mailing out today to all the new patrons. So thank you so much for all the new people and for all the people who've been supporting for months now uh, on this Taylor Marshall show. I do truly appreciate it. And I'll close with prayer. But before I do, I just want to emphasize the Holy Rosary. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team. One of the things that some of the saints say is that during the three days of darkness, you should light your candles and you should pray the rosary the whole time. You're probably not going to be sleeping. You're going to be praying the rosary nonstop. Why? Because that's how we meditate on Christ. That's how we think through the gospels the mysteries of the gospel, the joyful, the sorrowful, the glorious mysteries. These are the 15 mysteries that Mary gave us through St. Dominic. We must pray the rosary. She came down at Fatima, Portugal and said, pray the rosary daily. So we must pray the rosary every single day, especially when times are tough, especially if anything apocalyptic happens, you must pray the rosary. So have blessed candles and have a blessed rosary. Get your rosary blessed by a priest. It doesn't have to be. It's just a good thing to do. And pray that rosary every day. If you're a dad watching this, you should be leading your wife and your children every single evening in the rosary. 365 days a year. Are you going to mess it, miss it because of illness or travel or something like that? It could happen. But your goal as a man of God, as a father and a husband, is to lead your wife and your children in the rosary every single night. If you have a child, that child from infancy to the year 18 should pray the rosary with you 365 nights a year. Just do it. Just make that commitment. Pray the rosary. All right. And now we'll close in prayer. 
We'll pray the Hail Mary in Latin, and we'll pray the Glory Be in Latin. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et or mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Uh, I will be doing some more videos. People are asking, can you do something about the warning, the illumination of consciences? Can you do something on the great French monarch? All of these things are related. Uh, the age of Mary, the great pontiff, which we heard about today, uh, and Blessed Anna Maria. So I am going to be doing some research and preparing all those topics, and maybe we'll take this video and those videos and make like a playlist of all these sort of end time private revelation things. People have a lot of questions about them. I think it's good to have clarity. So make sure you do subscribe to this channel so you get those future uh, uh, live video presentations uh, on these topics. So again, thanks so much for watching. Remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. We'll see you again in our video tomorrow and the next day, Friday. Till then, Godspeed.